Section 7 of The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Alice Dodd. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 1, Section 7, The Jeweled Ibis, by J. C. Kofoed. Chapter 2, In the Darkness. It was one of those nasty, wet nights that are so frequent during the English autumn. Hudson walked through labyrinths of filthy streets, where it was dangerous for a well-dressed man to go, but no one paid any particular attention to him. The slop chest of the Asian did not furnish purple and fine linen. His clothes were as worn as that of any denizen of the district, and he was soaked to the skin. Sailors down on their luck are common enough in the East End. The American consulate was his intended haven. A mate who had lost an arm in the Chinese troubles was some sort of clerk there, and Dave was sure of a hearty welcome from him. As it happened, however, he did not get within miles of the consulate or genial Marty Mallory. By the time the engineer reached Spitalfield's garden, the rain had slackened, and he sat down on one of the benches. He had been doing the hardest kind of work since three in the morning, and even his almost tireless muscles had begun to feel the strain. Except for the flicker of an arc light, it was pretty dark there, and it was too chilly and wet to get any rest. So after a few moments he rose, squeezed the water from his cap, and started off. He had not taken ten steps before a girl came running toward him down the narrow, graveled path. A pretty slip of a maid, with dark, frightened eyes and the sweetest lips man ever longed for. She gasped with relief when she saw Dave's keen, bronzed face. In a moment, she was in front of him, with her hand trembling on his arm. Years of world-wandering had taught Hudson to mask his emotions. Though he was astounded beyond words, he merely smiled and took off his cap. "'Good evening, Miss Chandler,' he said. His heart commenced playing him the same tricks as it had when he first met her in Alexandria. "'For God's sake, help me,' she panted. "'They're at my heels, and this is my last chance. "'Take this,' she pressed something into his hands, "'and carry it to Mr. Drexel Chandler at the Ritz-Carlton. "'Will you do this for me?' "'I would do anything for you,' said the seaman, "'not noticing how obvious were his words. "'Oh, thank you. "'Guard it with your life, Mr. Hudson.' It is the jeweled ibis. Then, in a flash, she was gone. The jeweled ibis again. Now what the deuce did it mean? The ibis, of course, was a crane-like bird sacred to the Egyptians. But what had that to do with the bundle in his hand? Or the quarrel that had led to the murder of Tony? He could not, for the life of him, understand. He walked under the arc light to examine the thing that had been entrusted to him. The wrappings had fallen off, and in his palm lay an image of the ibis. It was probably six inches high and made of hard black wood, ebony most likely, and was inlaid from the tip of the curved beak to the claws with most exquisite jewels. It must have been worth thousands upon thousands of dollars, entirely aside from its value as an antique. But the value of the thing only added a more opaque tint to the mystery. What was Marion Chandler doing in the East End? And how could she be mixed up in the same affair as Captain Cullen? What was this mystery that generated murders and pursuits and the trusting of a penniless sailor man with priceless jewels? But, and a smile lit his bronzed face, the girl had trusted him. That was a guerdon of honor, and he intended seeing the ibis safely in the hands of the man for whom it was intended. There came a pattering of feet along the path, and the engineer hastily wrapped the gem in its covering and thrust it into his pocket. The police would take it from him as quickly as the little lady's pursuers. They would not believe that a poor man could come by such a thing honestly. But it was not a bobby who ran down the path of Spitalfield's garden. It was a burly man whose coat only partly hid his evening clothes. He was an extraordinarily ugly chap, with a flat, wide nose, thick lips, and fierce yellow eyes. He hesitated for an instant when he saw Hudson, then walked over with an odd sort of smile. "'Might I inquire, sir?' he asked in English with an Oxford accent. 
If you saw a lady pass by, I will make it worth your while if you will point out the way she took. He peered searchingly at Dave, who had drawn back in the shadows. There was something puzzling in his attitude. I couldn't tell you, said Hudson quietly. The man, who looked like a Shenzi from Nubia for all his fine clothes, took a step nearer. A sudden stealthy softness came into his voice. You do know, he sibilated, and by Zeus, the greatest of all gods, I will force you to tell. Did you think I had not penetrated your disguise, Hudson Effendi? Your time in Egypt was not spent for pleasure. It is Chandler who employs you, and for him you seek to penetrate the secret of Sesostris. Is it not so? I don't know what you're talking about, said Hudson, exasperated, and I don't give a tinker's continental, my friend. Take your hand off my arm. Another knife, eh? The brown man struck him in the face with all his strength, and Hudson went to his knees, dazed. Before he could struggle up, the Shenzi was at his throat. Now Hudson was as strong a man as ever sailed the seas, but for that first treacherous blow he might have overmastered his enemy. As it was, he was bent backward by the dark man, who tried to get his knife hand free. Hudson did not lose his head and struggle frantically, but concentrated his efforts on keeping the weapon away. But his assailant was as strong as the sacred bull, and inch by inch the blade crept nearer. In those moments the only thing Hudson regretted was that Marion had found him a broken reed, and that she would lose her jewel after all. He had been in too many tight places during his adventurous career to admit defeat before he had to, but he nearly admitted it then. He hardly expected a policeman to appear. They were too busy making ragged wanderers move on to stop a murder in the heart of London town. His life depended on his own slowly waning strength. The knife continued its slow and jerky but terribly inevitable journey towards Hudson's throat. The African's dark, twisted face was close to his. He meant to kill Dave, and nothing but a miracle could stop him. The miracle happened. A shadow slipped along the sharp, spiked iron railing surrounding the garden. Dave felt a body brush by him. Then his assailant's head jerked back. A great puffing sigh escaped his lips, and the knife dropped from his nerveless hand. For a moment, he stood swaying like a drunken man a blot of blood creeping out of his hair into his eyes. Then his knees buckled under him, and he sank into a dreadfully contorted heap on the sidewalk. Panting for breath, Hudson straightened up in time to see his rescuer vault the body and speed away in the darkness. In that fleeting instant, he caught a glimpse of the lean, ascetic profile of a man of, say, five and thirty, an utter stranger. And yet, yet... There was something vaguely familiar about that face, something, pausing only to ascertain that the supposed Nubian was still breathing, Hudson hastened away. It was a prison matter if he was found with the unconscious man at his feet. Besides, he was anxious to complete his trust and deliver the jeweled ibis to Mr. Drexel Chandler. It was a long walk through the rain, but Dave was so engrossed with his thoughts that he totally ignored the physical discomfort. He was wondering about this fellow, Chandler. Ordinarily, his concern would have been with the man who attacked him, but this puzzle superseded that one in interest. Was Chandler, by any quirk of an unkind fate, Marion's husband? The thought stirred his heart into turmoil. He wanted that girl as he had never wanted anything in his life. And if she were free, he would work his fingers to the bone for the money that would enable him to support a wife. But if she were married, the thought depressed him, and he tried to forget it. When he halted at last in the garish glow of the big hotel, he felt rather diffident about entering. His slop-chest clothes were wrinkled and soaking wet, and he looked as though he had been padding the hoof for a thousand miles. He overcame that momentary hesitation, and squaring his broad shoulders, walked up the steps. A few overdressed people laughed, and a shocked clerk tried to hurry him out, but Dave Hudson wasn't the hurrying kind. His keen, weather-bronzed face, topped with its tawny mane, made an impression that was furthered by his incisive manner of speaking. After murmuring, preposterous and unprecedented, 
the clerk agreed to send a note up to Mr. Chandler, being assured that it really was a matter of life and death. The note Dave scrawled was calculated to gain admittance, though decidedly brief. He wrote, I must see you at once on important business, and signed it, The Man with the Jeweled Ibis. A boy carried it up to Mr. Chandler's suite. The buttons, grown suddenly obsequious, came down presently and escorted Hudson to the lift. When they reached the fourth floor, another personage in blue and gold took him in hand and led him through a maze of corridors to what was, he learned later, the most expensive suite of rooms in the hotel. A studious-looking man of, say, five-and-thirty, with an alert, nervous manner, threw open the door. It was the identical chap who had saved Hudson from the Shenzi in Spitalfield's garden. "'Mr. Drexel Chandler, sir,' announced the servant, and to the gentleman in the door, "'Mr. Hudson, sir.' Dave drew a deep breath, but repressed any exhibition of surprise. Apparently there were even more angles to the affair than he had believed. "'Good evening,' he said quietly. "'I didn't expect to see you again quite so soon.'" End of Section 7